woman of Cana came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, thy son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not me to take the children's bread, and to cast it to dogs. And she said, True, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thy will. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. May the Lord's rich blessing be to the public reading of his word. May it be sanctified in the hearts, the minds, the spirits, and the souls of God's people. Let's pray together, shall we? Uh, Father, we bow before you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanking you, Lord, this for this Mother's Day 2021 for all the mothers and all of the uh, children and husbands and friends that are gathered with them today. Pray that this be a special day of blessing for them. We pray that you'll take these words, that uh, you'll speak through your servant to bless all that are, that are in attendance here and all that were here via the means of virtual media. If you please you to open the heart of some man, some woman, some boy or girl, they might believe the gospel, that Jesus lived a perfectly sinless life, died for their sins, was sacrificed on the cross, his blood was shed, that they were buried and raised from the dead on the third day that's ascended back to the right hand of the Father, sent the Holy Spirit. May they put their trust in you today and be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the, in the presence of the Lord. I want to speak to you this morning from the simple subject. I'm not going to be long, but what happens in, in heaven when mothers pray? What happens in heaven when mothers pray? If many of us were called upon to testify this morning and to give a reason and a word as to how we have made it through to this point, out of some of the dangers, out of some of the snares, out of some of the turbulent and difficult situations that we got ourselves into, many of us would lift our voice and testify that we had a praying mother, we had a praying grandmother, a praying aunt, that we had some women that loved us and that sacrificed for us and that would not give up on us when many others had given up on us and even when we were prepared to give up on ourselves. It's one of the great gifts that most of us have had, that many of us have had, is the gift of loving females, normally mother, grandmother, or a motherly figure in our lives that, that spoke to us that whispered words of encouragement in our ears, that gave us warm embraces to affirm that we were valued, that we really did count, that sacrificed for us all the days of our lives. And we stand today here in 2020 and we look back over the treacherous and the dangerous roads of which we have traveled. And we praise and we bless the Lord for those mothers and for those mother figures in our lives that meant so much to us. And the longer we live, the more we value them and appreciate all that they have done for us. And so for many of us, that's what Mother's Day is. We look back over the road from which we've come. And as we look out over this audience this morning, most of our mothers have gone on to be with glory. To glory. A few of you still have your mothers with you. Sister Terrell has borne witness and testified today with a powerful testimony. But we would, would look back with a tinge of sadness because we can't look back without being sad when we realize what we no longer have with us. But we also look back with a great sense of joy and a great sense of appreciation to know that somebody loved us enough to sacrifice us for us 
And that's what affirms our dignity. That's what affirms our world worth. In the midst of all of the trouble that we have in our society today, there are times that I'm reminded that we still have a potent and a powerful weapon. And that potent and powerful weapon is the prayers of the mothers and the mothers of heart at the church. As I look around our church on occasion, every now and then, not every now and then, almost every single day, there's something that has to be prayed for. And before I can think about it, my email will uh, light up, my phone will buzz, and Sister uh, Janet Lawson has already got it out there. And she and Sister Virginia Lipkin and Mother Tolliver, they've already got out on the prayer line. It's already went halfway around the world. The woman is on the prayer list. And it always warms my heart to know that the mothers of the church are keeping watch over the flock. And the mothers of the church have their hearts and their minds on the pulse of the church. And they're activating the prayer line so that people will know that they are being prayed for and that someone is thinking about them. And that's a great gift. It's a great gift to this, the Grace Bible Church. And I'm sure that many churches all over this city have that type of gifted women that are committed to prayer. I don't know if there's any that have a group that's more committed to prayer than the women of the Grace Bible Church, and for that I'm indeed grateful. So there's always hope in our society when somebody can get a prayer through. It doesn't take everybody able to get a prayer through, but when somebody can get a prayer through, when somebody believes that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous still avails much with God, when somebody believes that God's attention can still be captured, and that's what happens in heaven when mothers pray. When mothers pray, their prayers reach the throne room of God, and their prayers reach the ear of God, and their prayers capture the attention of God. That's what happens in heaven when mothers pray. God's attention is brought to bear on a situation and on a circumstance and we have God's attention, all the things that could happen can happen. Nothing is impossible when we have God's attention. But not only does the prayer of mothers enter into the ear of God and get the attention of God, it activates the hand of God. It activates the hand of God. We must still believe that God's hand is not short. God's hand is not short. God's bicep is not atrophied. God has not lost any of his power. God has not, not lost any of his potency, my brothers and my sisters. Uh, Brother Elder Tom talks about how I've, been, I've been having trouble with my shoulder. And that's my left shoulder. And so one day Dr. Stanton was here, he knows me pick up something, I kind of grimaced. When I, he said, what's going on with that? I said, well, Doc, I got this pain in my shoulder. And uh, so, you know, the doc, man, he's going to examine you right on the spot. So the doc does this little examination. He said, you need to get that checked out. There might be something going on in there. I said, well, doc, it might be going on, but it's not bothering me that bad because I don't want them going in there to figure out what's going on just yet. I said, it's not on the, the, the right hand. I'm right-handed, doc. I said, I'm still, I still can move food back and forth. He said, no, you need to get that checked out. So sure enough, I... He did the doctor's advice, and I went up to this orthopedic surgeon that he got me connected with. And so he did an exam, and they took x-rays, and I got a bill longer than this church. And I said, my goodness, man. And so at the end of the day, he said, well, you still got, you still got strength. He said, you got strength in the shoulder. He said, what I can see is nothing torn inside of it. He said, I just want you to start working it and take much of the pain as you can. He gave me some exercises and stuff to do. He said, because it's, as long as you got strength still in there, as long as you got still got the strength and there's nothing torn inside of there and, and the arthritis isn't that bad at all. He said, you still can get a lot of good use and got a good utility out of that shoulder. So I, I felt pretty good after that brother Thurman. I went back and got me a couple of two pound uh, barbells. I, I can lift two pounds. He said, I got a little strength in there. So if I can just strengthen the little strength that is there and maybe I can get it stronger and I can get that motion that I have kind of lost over time. So what I'm trying to tell you is long as there are people in the church who can get God's attention through prayer, we have access to the power of God. And as long as we got a little strength, a little strength 
can serve to activate the rest of the body of Christ. And when we get God's attention and we see God moving in the church and moving in people's lives, that will stir our faith that we believe that God can move in our situation. So when the mothers of the church pray, it enters the ear of God, it captures God's attention, it moves the hand of God, it activates the arm of God, which is not atrophied, which does not have a little strength, but a lot of strength, and then God can activate his power on our behalf. And that's why I'm always excited when I see the email from the women's prayer chain, from the mother's prayer chain, because I believe that the ear of God has been entered, that God's attention has been brought to a situation, that God's hand is getting ready to be activated, and God is getting ready to unleash his power in a situation, in a circumstance that's going to stir somebody's faith, that's going to encourage somebody to keep on believing and keep on trusting in God. Just give me a few moments. I'm not going to be long this morning. I could call off some of the women in the Bible who prayed. Uh, Eve, I'm sure she prayed that God would give her another son after Cain had slain his brother Abel. Sarah prayed when her womb was closed and she couldn't have a child. And she concocted up a situation where she had her husband Abram to go in to Hagar and then he conceived Ishmael. Now she's created a big mess. Rebecca prayed. Rachel prayed. Leah play, prayed. Moses' mother prayed, Hannah, she prayed, Ruth prayed, Samson's mama prayed, Elizabeth prayed, Mary prayed. They all prayed. But they all had some standing with God. <laughs> they had some connection to God. God either made a, a, a promise to one of them or God had chosen them to do something special. So they had some type of standing, some type of place with God where they believed that they could get God's attention. But I want to talk to you about when a mama prays who on the surface, it doesn't appear that she has any connection with God. No standing with God. No, no place with God. What happens when an ordinary mother prays who has the faith to believe that God is still able to do exceedingly abundantly of all that we could ask or think according to this power. What happened when she prays? Well, I'm glad someone asked that question. If someone wants to know what happens when an ordinary woman prays, so ordinary that Matthew didn't even think to record her name. <laughs> he just refers to us, uh, her as a Syrophoenician woman, which means that she was a Greek, which means that she was a Gentile which means that she was outside of the commonwealth of Israel. She had no claim on God, no pedigree, no relationship, no connection, nobody to give her standing with God. But what she had was a heart that was burdened over the situation with her little daughter. And so she believed that if I can just get his attention, maybe God will move on my behalf. So it's like Jesus moving from Tyre inside him in this Canaanite woman. You know, remember the biblical text, the Canaanites have been enemies of the Jews all the way back over in the Old Testament. Ever since the nation came up out of Egypt, they were battling with the Canaanites. So this woman who was a descendant of the enemies of God, God's enemies, the people that have been a thorn in God's people's side for hundreds of years, she had the audacity to believe that she could call out to Jesus Christ and she could get his attention and that she might move in her situation. She was a woman with a, with a disturbed heart, a woman with a, a broken heart. So the Sinai Phoenician woman, she cries out and her simple prayer was simply, have mercy on me, O Lord, thy son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. A simple prayer, have mercy on me, thy son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But that prayer is jam-packed with a significant amount of spiritual knowledge and insight that she had. First of all, she had came to a conclusion as to who Jesus was, far beyond what many of the Jews had come to. She understood that he was the son of David. 
And that was a term that was used to describe him as being in the messianic line. So she had concluded in her mind some kind of way, Brother Lawson, through hearsay. Through hearsay, through this miracle-working extravaganza from Nazareth of Galilee was not any ordinary prophet or miracle worker, but he was the long-promised Messiah that God had promised to the Jews. And some kind of way, she'd had some understanding of the Old Testament record that the Gentiles would eventually have some access or some way to be connected to him. She would not allow the bigotry against her. Will somebody help me today? The bigotry that was against her on behalf of the Jewish people who looked at disdain upon the Gentiles and the Samaritan, she would not let that stand in the way of her getting her prayer to Jesus. She did not care what his ethnicity was. She did not care what his skin color was. She did not care what his hair texture was. She believed that he was the son of David, the long-awaited Messiah, the anointed one. And as the long-awaited Messiah, the anointed one, he had supernatural powers and ability that no human man would have. So she was willing to fling herself at his mercy. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost, this morning. I just stopped by to tell you that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is an equal opportunity Savior. It's whosoever will, let him come. In this broken and divided nation that we currently have today, with all of the schism that we have, and we find a reason to fall out over every single time thing, it's time for us as the church to come back together and try to bring people together to realize our only hope of uniting a fractured, broken nation is us to come to grips with who Jesus Christ of Nazareth is. He's not a Democrat. He's not a Republican. He's not on any political side. He does not play racial partisanship. He's the savior of the whole world, of the whole world. He's the only hope of forgiveness, the only hope of salvation. In him, we are made complete. And we can be reconciled across our racial differences, our cultural differences. We can be come together and realize he's called us to be one new man and woman, the church of the living Christ, to give the world hope. This Syrophoenician woman. This ordinary woman, this nobody who's not identified in the biblical text recognizes something that even the spiritual Jews did not recognize. He was the hope for the whole world, not just the Jewish nation. That they didn't have no monopoly on him. Will somebody help me today? No group of people got no monopoly on God. God does not pay favoritism. You play a monopoly game and you can get all the hotels and all the properties. You can monopolize the board and you can hold everybody else hostage. In God's game, God gives nobody the power to hold everybody else hostage. Because in the end, God has the final say. This ordinary woman, this Syrophoenician woman, this mother with this daughter who had a devil grievously vexed. And I'm sure she was the public embarrassment of the town. Help me somebody. Somebody really want to hurt you. Somebody really want to stick a dagger in your heart. They don't talk about you. They talk about your children, Brother Rick. They talk about your children. I know they've been talking about this woman's child, this demon-possessed girl, this deranged individual wreaking havoc in the public school system, placed in the behavioral disorder class, mild, mentally impaired, behaviorally retarded. He's brought nothing but shame and disgrace to her mama, but her mama never was ashamed of her. Her mama still was her advocate. Oh, somebody ought to help me today. What if these single mamas on the west side of Charleston would decide, regardless of how my children came into the world, in wedlock, out of wedlock, padlock, on the back of the bus, they are God's gift to me. And I believe they are God's gift to this society. Oh, and what if they would become advocates for their children? Advocates for their children in every single sphere of the society. Fight that their kids get the best education they can get. Find a tutor, find a mentor to help them with things that they cannot help them with. Show up at the school board meeting. Show up any time there's a chance to come and serve as an advocate. But more importantly, getting their kids up. Well, starting the day before, two or three days before, to get them ready to come to church on Sunday. You know, there's one 
There's one great blessing, Sister Terrell, about the new hairstyles. You can just come the way you want to come. You ain't got this bit all week. I used to feel so sorry, so sorry for my sister, Sister Lawson. So sorry. They had thick hair, man, and they go out and they would get wet and they played ball with the boys, did all that stuff. You know, now that stuff that kind of went back to its natural state. And now they got to get their hair washed and mama got that straightening comb. And that, thing, that thing is on an open flame, man. It's, it's red, you know. And you know how them, you know how them kitchens can get back down to their neck. And my mama was, was not somebody who had a whole lot of mercy and compassion. You understand what I'm trying to say? And I can see them right now. They just cried and weep and they cried. And mama was slapping that straightening comb. And the guy tried to get that hair a little bit straight so to go to church on Sunday morning. All y'all listen to me. We ain't got to do that now. Just braid it. Just plant it. Just let it fly east, west, north, and south. Just show up. In the name of the Lord. So now we ain't got no excuse. We can go swimming on Friday and Sunday if we want to. And now the hairstyle, we can just come. And why don't we just bring our children out, just bring them out and say, we're going to present them to the Lord. I would long to see today, my brothers and my sisters, where there was a parade coming down um, uh, McCorkle Avenue and a parade coming down Vine Street and crossing over the Sims of Mamas bringing their children saying, pray for these boys and pray for these girls and we could be lined up, laying hands on the children, praying and ask the Lord for a breakthrough. That's the type of mamas we need in 2021, Brother Lawson. That's the type of mamas we need. Just ordinary mamas who refuse to give up on their children like the Syrophoenician woman. And so when she comes to Jesus, she said, Lord, have mercy on me. All that's near and dear to me in this world is this little girl. With all of her demons, with all of her devilishness, with all of her dysfunction, with all of her confusion, she's still the nearest and the ne dearest thing to me. If Lord, if you want to do something for me, help my little demon-possessed girl. Help her, Lord. Help me. And then the Lord puts up a barrier. He's going to challenge and he's going to test her face. How determined are you? How resolute are you? How serious are you about this situation? He didn't answer her words. Silence doesn't mean no. A delay doesn't mean a denial. Just because God does not appear to have answered your prayer request at this point, it doesn't mean that she didn't, he hadn't heard it. It doesn't mean that it's not denied. So the Bible says that Jesus didn't answer her a word, but he answers and says something to the disciples. He says, now, I didn't only came to those of the sheep of the house of Israel. They are my priority. I believe that this was a test. It was a test for the disciples, a test to see what is their compassion quotient. How much compassion do they have? Do they have compassion outside of those of their own household? I believe that Jesus was wanting to solicit from his disciples the Lord. She just got one little girl. She's demon possessed. Lord, can't we just help just one Gentile? Can't we just help one Syrophoenician? This was a test for the disciples to see how much compassion do y'all have and how well do you understand the compassion that I have. It wasn't to deny her, it was to challenge them. I believe that God is challenging the church today. I preached a sermon during the pandemic a few months ago. I think it's one of the most important sermons I've ever preached. I asked a simple question. Is the church still an essential institution in America? Are we still essential? Does the world still view us as absolutely essential to the quality of life, to improve in life, to making things better in the society? Does the world still look to us for answers to life's perplexing questions? Are we still an essential institution? And I think the Lord was wanting to solicit for him disciples for them to intercede and to plead on behalf of this Syrophoenician Gentile woman. And with all the problems we have in our society, which we don't have the means to fix, the resources to fix, but we've got to stand in the gap and we've got to plead and cry out to God for the homeless, 
for the people who are addicted to the opioids and the heroin. And we see our society grabbing this whole thing. Do we give people needles? Do we not give people needles? Can we stop HIV from spreading? Can we start hyper, uh, uh, hepatitis from spreading? All these problems that we are dealing with for which there is no simple solution to the human dilemma. But it's a need for somebody to cry out to God and say, Lord, can you help those that we are unable to help? But the disciples, Sister D, they failed the test. They failed the test because they, they said to the Lord, Lord, uh, she, she's bothering us. She's worrying us. She hadn't called their name. She hadn't asked them to help her. She was asking the Lord to help her. Look at verse 25. I'm going to close in just a second. Then came she and worshipped him. See, that's the key verse right there. That shows that she had moved beyond thinking that he was just a witch doctor, right? Thinking that he was just some type of physician who had the ability to prescribe some miraculous cure. When she understood that he was the divine Savior, the son of David, she also understood that he was worthy of worship, and the worship has to proceed, it has to go before me getting what I think I deserve. So he's worthy of worship whether or not he answers me or not. Oh, this is powerful. She had concluded he is worthy of worshiping, being worshiped, of being praised. He's worthy of being adored and to be magnified even when I have cried out to him and he's appeared to be silent to me. He's still worthy in his person. So she bows down and she worshiped him, the text says. And then she simply says, Lord, help me. No long diagnosis, Brother Frank. Not that I took him to the psychiatrist. I done took him to the mental health experts. He's had this test. She's had this test. She's had that test. She didn't go into all of that. And I'm sure she did everything she could to get her. She just says, Lord, help me. Me. This is beyond my capacity. It's beyond my ability. It's beyond my skills. And that's where mamas have to come to. Lord, help me. Help me with this situation. Help me with this circumstance. Help me with this problem. Because she believed that in his divine omniscience, he knew all the details. He knew all the particulars. He knew the type of help that she needed. And then he answers her. And then he answers her. A Syrophoenician woman, ordinary woman, whose name is not even recorded in the biblical text, outside of the commonwealth of Israel, not a part of the household of faith, but who comes to faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, as the Savior of the world, as the Son of David, and has worshipped him and cries out to him for help. And the Bible says, and then he answered her. But it wasn't the answer that she was wanting to hear. He answered and said, it's not good, it's not appropriate, it is not fitting for me to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. Now, I don't know how we want to fix this up or dress this up. But what Jesus says, I come to the household of Israel. They are the children. They have the divine priority. I came to seek and to save. It's the Jew first. And I came primarily to the Jew. And he says, I know there's some nice little house puppies around. Nice pets, house puppies. And these house puppies are allowed to be in the house. He used the term of a house puppy, not a scavenger dog. You know where I come from, dogs live outside. I had to come to the city and realize that dogs live inside. My mama said that's why they got fur, because they supposed to live outside. So we didn't have dogs that live inside, but I came to the city, dogs live inside, and they eat better than some people eat inside. They got better bed, better sleeping. I even saw people walking dogs the other night, got coats and jackets on. That's just the way they roll there here in the city. Dogs are very well taken care of. But this is a little puppy dog, and Jesus says it's just not right. Even you got a, a house dog, a, a puppy dog. A pet, a house pet. I can't take bread from the children and feed the dogs with bread that's supposed to go to the children. But this woman's faith 
it was so innovative. It was so creative. She was so resolute. She was so determined. She said, Lord, whatever you say is right. And I have no reason, no right to contradict or to challenge anything that you say. But my own response, Lord, children at the table can be a little bit messy. Children at the table can be wasteful. They don't appreciate all the time that mama has put in to preparing the meal. They don't appreciate how expensive the meal is. So children at the table can be messy. And while they're eating the food on the table, there are crumbs that fall off the table onto the floor. Aren't the puppy dogs entitled to eat the crumbs that fall on the floor? Don't, can, can't they have the crumbs that fall on the floor? I don't never see no mama sweeping up no crumbs and putting them back on the kid's plate. Can't we just have the crumbs? What I stopped by to tell you, this mama knew how to pray, and once she got God's attention, she knew how to communicate with him. And she says, in essence, Lord, you got enough healing just in the crumbs from the table. I don't need a prescription to go to Drug Emporium. I don't need a, a prescription to go to Walgreens, Lord. Just the crumbs from the table as enough. I stopped by to tell the mamas this morning, don't give up praying. Because when you pray, it gets heaven's attention. It enters the ear of God. It activates the hand of God. It moves the heart of God. And God has already sent Jesus Christ to the earth. He's had the human experiences. He's been touched with the feeling of our infirmity. He can identify with us. He can relate to us. He's lived the perfectly sinless life crucified and went back to glory and then he sent the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of us who makes intercessions for us and so now God can prescribe the exact remedy that he needs even from the crumbs from the table. All we need Brother Terrell is just the crumbs from the table of Jesus that can bring deliverance to our children that appear to be deranged, that can bring stability back to families, that can mend broken relationships, that can heal wounded spirits, just the crumbs from the table. The society has become very complicated today. We got a specialist for this, and we got a specialist for that, and we got someone that can take care of this and take care of this. My little granddaughter is two years old, and y'all know the story. She had COVID undiagnosed, asymptomatic when her mama and her older sister had it. Didn't have a single symptom. Three weeks later, she comes down with a fever of 106 and a half. The doctors couldn't get the fever down, couldn't figure out what it was. They ran 30-some tests trying to get the diagnosis. And to then my daughter, who's a nurse, say, y'all need to test her for uh, uh, th this disease that kids have developed like Kawasaki disease. It was just kind of miraculous. They figured this whole thing out. Now, I know everybody's going to give credit to this special medication and to that special medication, but let me tell you what. It's when the Grace Bible Church women activate the prayer line, I'm telling you, when the prayer starts going toward heaven, the temperature came down from 106.5 to 103, and the doctor said, we got to get a down before 100 before we give her the medication. Then it came down to 100. Then it came down to 98.6, and then it stabilized long enough for them to give her the medication, and once she got the medication, they could give her the whole medication regimen. I just thought about to tell you, as a witness, as a testimony, I believe in the prayer of God's people activated when Sister Lawson and Sister Regina and Mother Tolliver activated the women in prayer and the church in prayer. They got God's attention and God's hand was activated and God moved all the way down from heaven, all the way to Pennsylvania Avenue, all the way to Women and Children's Hospital, all the way to my granddaughter's room and God made the difference and I stopped by this morning. I'm going to give him the praise. I'm going to give him the glory. I'm going to magnify his holy name because he is worthy. He is worthy. And she got to go back to heart specialists and lung specialists and kidneys, all these different specialists to make sure that her organs were not damaged during that high fever. But I'm still believing in God and I'm still trusting God. And she's back to her rambunctious, mean, moving, destructive, tearing up everything, telling everybody off self. And for that, I say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. When mothers pray, 
Heaven is activated. And the power of heaven is activated to come down to the earth. Let me wrap this up. Verse 26, but he answered and said, it's not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, truth, Lord. Amen. You're preaching, preaching. But Lord, yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. And what she was saying, Lord, if I get to be in the kingdom, you can't insult me so much to make me not want to go to heaven. So what she was saying is, if the Gentiles say we dogs, if that's what they say we are, but if I get to go to heaven, I'd rather be a dog in heaven than be a king or queen in hell. I'll be satisfied, Lord, being anything you want me to be as long as I get to get into the kingdom of God. She says, even the dogs get to eat the crumbs that fall from the children's table. And then Jesus answered and said unto her, oh, woman, you got some great faith. I've been around these religious disciples of mine. I've been with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all these people that went to church every Sabbath and read the law and read the Torah and memorized scriptures and they tied their income but they didn't have enough faith to get themselves into heaven. You got great. Be it under thee even as thou will. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. My brothers and my sisters, I'm not preaching this morning some hopeful salvation, no get a wishbone and wish for this or wish for that. We're talking about heaven. We're talking about the power of God to be activated. It's still activated by the prayers of ordinary people whose hearts are filled with hope and love and devotion for God and who wants to do God's will. And if we cry out to him, we can still activate his hand. And that's what we so desperately need in our nation today. The most powerful military, the most advanced technology, the economic envy of the world, the best medical hospitals, the best medical facilities known to the human race, the best trained people in all these particular areas, but a small, invisible, novel coronavirus literally brought us to our knees and except by the grace of God our nation could have been utterly destroyed become extinct and it's time for us to bow with a thanking and a blessing and to praise his holy name except the Lord had not extended compassion his mercy toward us we could have been consumed So we stand on this May the 9th, 2021, at the Grace Bible Church. And man, God has been good for us this last year, year plus. God watched over us. God protected us. God fed us and clothed us and housed us. Gave us fellowship over the phone and internet and emails and texts and sales. And then it seemed to please him to open the door for us to come back to be to see each other again face to face. What a joy. What a joy. As I close, there used to be a song, I wish I could remember all the words, it was in a commercial about simple pleasures are the best. Life's simple pleasures. And I pray that by the grace of the Lord that we were all today to realize to have people around us that we love and people around us that love us. That's a simple pleasure. It's a simple pleasure to be enjoyed. Amen? And the Sister Terrell already testified. We we don't know. This may be the last Mother's Day that this group gathers here together. Next year somebody might be missing. This might be the last service that this group gathers together. Let us thank God for it. Amen? Let us thank God for it. And let us not squander away this day to keep believing the Lord. Keep crying out to him, trusting him, and believing that he can do what we can't do, what needs to be done. Amen? God bless you. Let's bow for prayer, shall we?